Good afternoon, everyone. This is Leela Hernandez with American University School of Communication. I'm excited to have everyone in attendance today. We have a really great session planned. Uh, before we get into the presentation, I would like to go over some introductory information to get everyone acclimated with the platform that we are using. This webinar is automatically muted, so your interface with us will be the chat box in the corner. Feel free to type questions throughout the presentation and we will address them in our Q&A session at the end of the presentation after the webinar. Oops. Again, I'm your host for today's webinar. Uh, not only do I work in the School of Communication, but I am also an alum. I received my master's degree from SOC in 2010, so I'm happy to speak to you both as a staff member and as a proud alum. And today I am honored to be joined by Professor Molly O'Rourke, the director of the Political Communication Program at SOC. She has more than 15 years of experience in the field of public opinion research. She has worked on Capitol Hill, for Emily's List, the Women's Political Action Committee, and more. I'm excited to have her here with us. Hello, Molly. Hello. <laughs> all right, uh, so during this webinar, I will be giving you all a general overview of the School of Communication and the professional opportunities available to our students. I will then, <clears throat> Uh, provide some information specifically about the MA in political communication, and I will also discuss the admissions process and financial aid opportunities. We will then have our master class with Professor Molly O'Rourke, and at the end of her presentation, we will open the floor to your questions. So I say, let's get started. Embedded in the communication capital of the world, the School of Communication at American University is uniquely positioned to plug you into the most compelling professional and intellectual opportunities of the 21st century. Our partnerships and connections with the likes of NPR, USA Today, The Washington Post, The Associated Press, The Discovery Channel, HBO, NBC News, Ogilvy Mather, Ketchum, and PBS, along with many more, combined with our thousands of successful of combined with our thousands of successful alumni, provide an unparalleled support system for advancement in these dynamic fields and beyond. Our Center for Environmental Filmmaking, Center for Media and Social Impact, and Investigative Reporting Workshop are engaged in profoundly impactful and meaningful work as our faculty, staff, and students strive to expand the constructive power of communication and media. Now, whether you want to be a communications director on a presidential campaign, a media consultant, devising national grassroots outreach, or a leading public affairs strategist guiding your client through a crisis, our Masters in Political Communication is for you. This MA program combines the expertise and scholarship from both the School of Communication and the School of Public Affairs to lay down a thorough grounding in political science, strategic communication, research, and media. Um, Professor O'Rourke, is there anything else you'd like to add about the program that makes it special in your eyes? Um, well, I, I'll talk a little bit about the program also to answer your questions, but I think one thing that makes our program especially unique is um, the approach uh, being really to strive for a balance between uh, true academic learning and also really applied practice. And a lot of the um, speakers who we bring in uh, because of our proximity to DC, we're really able to bring in people who are experts working in the field, but to be able to blend that with the um, academic preparation is really, I think, a unique aspect of our program. Fantastic. Um, yep, the program is 36 credits long. It takes two years to complete if you do it full time uh, or you can do it part time if you choose. Uh, you can also apply for this program to start in the spring or to start in the fall semester as well. So it's very flexible in that way. All right, let me now run through the application process. 
All right, so for your application to the MA in Strategic Communication, or for the MA in Political Communication, you are going to need to first complete the online application form, which is found on our website, and you'll need to submit the $55 application fee. Once you submit the application form, you can then get into the next part of the application, which is where you will upload your admissions essay and your resume. You will need to submit your university transcripts, and you will need to provide two letters of recommendation. And we make that really easy for you. All you have to do is type on, is click on the link that says letter of recommendation and type the email address of your recommender. And then your recommender will get an email from us asking them to click on a link and answer some specific questions about you. So that keeps their recommendations attached to your application. It makes it easier for you and it makes it easier for the recommender. I, I'm happy to announce that the GRE is not required for the MA in political communication. Uh, the GRE is only required for students applying to the MA in global media or applying to the PhD in communication, but the GRE is not required for the MA in political communication. If you are an international student applying to the MA in political communication, you will need to uh, send transcripts. You'll need to have your transcripts evaluated by either a company called WES, W-E-S, or a company called ECE, and they will uh, kind of translate your transcripts, <laughs> not just translate them into English, but also put the grades into the American 4.0 system. So for anyone whose transcripts are from outside of the United States, you do need to have those transcripts evaluated. And for anyone whose first language is not English, you will need to provide uh, TOEFL scores of at least 100 or an IELTS score of at least 7.0. And you'll also want to have that application completed by February 1st is the priority deadline if you're applying for the fall. Um, if you complete that application by February 1st, that gives you the best chance of being considered for a merit award. And a merit award can consist of either tuition remission or a graduate assistantship. Tuition remission might be $5,000 towards your tuition. It might be up to $15,000 towards your remission, towards your tuition. You could also be offered a graduate assistantship, which is where you get paired to work with a faculty member for 10 hours a week. And in return, you're paid in the form of a biweekly paycheck and the total of those paychecks will come to about $4,500. So that's money for you uh, that, that goes straight into your bank account for you to put towards tuition or towards your housing or towards your other expenses. Uh, there's no separate application to fill out to be considered for a merit award. You just apply to the MA in Political Communication program and when the faculty review your application for admission, that is also when they will decide whether or not to offer a merit award. And that actually concludes the general political communication program overview. Um, I am now going to turn things over to Professor Molly O'Rourke for her master class. And I'm also going to um, start up her presentation. And, and um, Molly, I turn it over to you. Great. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, just say a few words of introduction. Um, I uh, am really excited. This is my fourth year as the co-director of the political communication program. As I think you um, have already um, uh, been told that the program is a joint program between the School of Communication and the School of Public Affairs. I run things from the uh, SOC, the School of Communication side. Um, and I come to the program after um, uh, spending a long career in uh, uh, public opinion research where we play an integral role of melding um, uh, uh, quantitative and qualitative research with communication strategies, particularly around politics. So I said um, earlier on that one of the things that I like most about the program is its blend of the academic and um, the applied practice. This is something that I didn't have um, the opportunity to do when I was in graduate school because programs like this that 
um, really uh, tried to meet both goals or both objectives didn't uh, didn't exist. And so that's one of the things I I really um, like so much about the the program is that it provides students with that with the training and the skills that they need, but also uh, because we're um, so connected to the political world here in DC that students are doing fascinating internships and we're able to do case studies in a way that makes what they're learning in the classroom so much more relevant and so much more targeted towards students' um, professional goals. So I thought what I would do just for you know a 10 or um, a 10, 15 minute sort of sampling or teaser is um, maybe like a, a movie trailer. I wanted to provide just an overview of um, how I approach one of the courses in the program, which is Communication 639. If you're doing any uh, uh, work on your own, looking at classes that are required in the program, uh, Communication 639, political communication, is kind of the fundamental uh, grounding uh, required uh, class for the program. Most students take it in their first year. And um, I thought I would sort of give you an overview of that class and um, hopefully it gives you a little bit of a, a flavor for the kinds of things that you would be exposed to in the program. And I just want to add that, um, again, I think one of the, the advantages or the strengths of the program, because we're able to draw on both uh, the resources of SOC, the School of Communication, and SPA, Public Affairs, that students are um, really uh, being exposed to the best of communication strategy as well as public policy um, and government on the SPA side. And so the diversity of our requirements uh, is, I think, something that's pretty unique to our, our program. Students get training in communication, but they get training in research methodology, in um, basic uh, uh, legislative politics. And so they really, students leave the program with um, certainly um, in many cases, a specialization because of a student's particular interest or career goals, but really with a well-rounded skill set that allows them to um, be very, very marketable very uh, immediately after their program. So let me um, uh, jump into kind of an overview of the class, and then I'll look forward to taking some questions or discussion at the end. Um, this it, this I've condensed uh, what is really kind of a semester uh, long class into just a couple of slides to give you a sense of the types of topics that we deal with in political communication. So how we start is really our goal by the end of the class is for students to be able to design and analyze a communication pl uh, plan from multiple perspectives. So from the um, Leela, I'm not seeing it's, how. It's not giving Sorry, you. Can you? I can. Okay, great. I'll just maybe say next. Sorry, I'm not sure if I'm doing something wrong, but it's okay. So let me. Um, I'll, I'll kind of start with running through the different elements of the communication plan. First, very clearly, to identify what the goals and objectives are uh, of your communication, and this political campaign that we. Um, you know, that we focus on in the class, it can be an electoral campaign, uh, the campaign for Senate or for, uh, uh, for um, president or for governor, and you all would be potentially entering the program at a time in the 2018 midterms where we would have a lot of uh, great examples. But we also, um, uh, many students are, while well, they're interested in electoral politics, they really wanna get into political advocacy around issues or causes that they care about. So students who are passionate about the environment or about civil rights or about um, criminal justice reform or about children's issues. So when I, when I talk about a political campaign, I don't want you to think only of an electoral campaign. I want you to think more broadly about advancing your political goals um, uh, uh, with targeted audiences. So understanding what your goals and objectives are. And then the second is um, a view, kind of a, a, a assessment of the landscape. So what is the current political lay of the land? How do your target audiences feel about uh, your issue or your cause? What are the challenges? What are the opportunities? Who are the appropriate spokespeople? And then third, 
um, this invites a, a very uh, detailed conversation about target audiences. And um, there are usually multiple audiences in a campaign. Sometimes they are um, comprised of a traditional base group of supporters and activists who feel strongly about an issue, but you're counting on them to lead the campaign and to be opinion leaders um, uh, for your cause. And then there are reach audiences who may not know about your issue or who need to be persuaded. But we, we deal with audience segmentation um, in a very specific way because increasingly our technology and our mediums of communication allow us to do such refined audience targeting that it really doesn't make sense to be uh, talking about one audience, but instead about multiple audiences. And then the fourth element is um, the kind of general framing or theme of the campaign. That is, uh, why should people care or take action? What values are at stake? What priorities? What principles? Uh, and then next are, I call them proof points or evidence of um, show uh, to provide examples of what the kind of change that you're suggesting would bring about. How would it impact people? What would the benefits be? Um, uh, that kind of um, evidence can be sometimes um, quantitative ed evidence and statistical, or sometimes it can be kind of more thematic in terms of how it makes people feel. Um, the sixth element is the appeal itself. That is, what are you asking people to do? So one of the challenges I, I uh, have often early on in the course with my students is that they want to educate uh, uh, people, that they have brilliantly, you know, creative, designed campaigns, um, but the ask or the appeal is not yet very specific. And so we want to go into a campaign knowing exactly what it is we want to accomplish. And then that ties in with the final number seven. It's a goal that has to be measurable. So you need to be able to, throughout the, the course of your campaign, understand how you're doing. Um, toward your specific goals. So let's la launch into the uh, next slide in terms of the, um, the goal of the campaign. So I encourage students whenever they're thinking about uh, a political campaign, um, and you can go ahead and put all of the check marks up. Um, Leela, thank you. So what's the broad or the long-term goal? So you know, if your campaign is successful, in two years or three years, how are things going to be different? If it's an electoral campaign, then obviously there's a very important deadline of uh, when the election is, but oftentimes there's broader goals uh, beyond that. What behavior or attitude change are you seeking? Again, if it's an electoral campaign, often what you're just trying to do is to get people to vote for your candidate. But uh, on advocacy campaigns and even on electoral campaigns, the a uh, goal can be, um, there can be multiple goals, not just getting people to vote, but maybe getting people to volunteer, getting people to give money, uh, getting people to take some kind of action. And then what are the specific goals or objectives that progress toward that goal can be measured? So you see here on the right, goal setting, you should be specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. And realistic depends on many things like resources and um, uh, and capacity that we also then get into uh, entire classes talking about realistic uh, resources and, and how you know what's realistic. So we can go to the next slide, which is the landscape. Um, I had mentioned on, our, on the first slide that that was one of the um, uh, uh, early um, uh, activities in a, in a campaign is to sort of get an assessment of what's the current state of play on uh, the particular issue or problem. How much do people understand about it? Do they see it as a problem? What are the communication challenges specific to that problem or to that issue? And part of what we learn about, and again, I think this is um, the uh, evidence of the kind of the academic uh, training that comes into the program, we learn about people's mental models and something called confirmation bias, where uh, people uh, tend to interpret news and information in a way that confirms their pre-existing uh, beliefs. I like this uh, visual of two people looking out the window and seeing snowfall, and one person sees a snowman and 
you know, maybe is happy and thinks fun and the uh, uh, other person sees a shovel and thinks work and has a very different reaction. So you want to think of, you know, your problem or your cause um, in terms of the snowfall. How do people see it? Do they see it as a, uh, as a problem or as an opportunity? And what work needs to be done before you can even ask people to take action? And then on the next slide is um, uh, a bit of an overview of the audience. Um, and uh, again, matching your message to the audience. Uh, is something we spend a lot of time in the program uh, figuring out. So as I said earlier, there are often multiple target audiences and you want them to do different things. Uh, sometimes you're just looking for them, uh, um, a certain audience, not to oppose you. Sometimes you need them to really be leaders. Um, you want to understand who the decision makers are uh, and, and, and how do you reach them in order to reach the audience. So how do you reach the grass tops or the opinion leaders uh, on the issue so that then you can have um, a ripple effect in terms of reaching out to your audiences. I like this final point, think research, because that is my background and training and that is my um, something I'm always uh, in support of is that research, uh, whether it's um, quantitative survey research or qualitative focus group uh, research really helps you identify and define uh, your audience and match your message to your audience. And on the next slide, we spend an awful lot of the class talking about um, framing and uh, themes in a campaign. So what's the central idea or the central narrative of the, um, of the campaign? What is it that you're trying to communicate to people about why they should take action? And again, some of the things we learn about are the shortcuts and the, the, the mental models that people have that they use to uh, make sense of um, uh, themes. We take, um, or last year uh, in, in class, we uh, took two specific campaigns around uh, the issue of guns and talked about um, it from the perspective of uh, gun rights and uh, how framing uh, the issue around rights and uh, privacy uh, leads you in one direction and then talking about how uh, an alternative approach and talking about guns and safety and uh, reducing violence is a very different uh, frame or theme that leads you in a, in a different direction. And how do um, those values that are at stake, how do you communicate those in a way that make your frame or your definition of the issue be the one that's relevant or dominant for, uh, for, for your audiences. Then we can go to the next slide. I mentioned before that every campaign, after you've gotten people's attention and you've framed your issue, that you want to have some proof points. You want to have evidence to people about why this issue matters. And even how you describe your proof points has very different implications. So you can see in the orange box, uh, should you, if you're um, running a campaign to uh, try and increase funding maybe for global health and development, should you talk about um, reducing the 10% chance of mortality or should you talk about increasing the 90% chance of survival? Do you want a negative or a positive? Is a threat more motivating than a more lofty or aspirational goal. We talk a lot about that. The truth is there's usually not one answer. It depends. Even you can think of multiple examples yourself when you think about um, even an issue like climate change. Um, do advocates talk about um, what could be if we were to pass and, and make success uh, successful um, inroads in addressing climate change? Or do we talk about the threat and what will continue to happen? And it's, it's uh, um, the, the presentation of these proof points uh, ends up being very, very important for uh, the campaign. And again, a lot of this is matching your audience to uh, the specific message and appeal that you know works uh, for, your, um, for the constituency that you're trying to reach out to. We talk about language traps. Uh, using your uh, 
uh, oftentimes unwittingly using your um, opponent's uh, or language um, to define your issue, how you get past that, um, and um, how you kind of tap into people's emotional models and as well as their own experience relative to an issue um, to make it more relevant and to make it more meaningful. And then finally, um, as I said, one of the things that I think uh, uh, many campaigns uh, struggle with is, um, ironically, the final appeal. So you've done all this hard work of, um, of framing your issue correctly, doing a situational analysis, defining target audiences, um, and then you get down, you've kind of got their attention and um, you need to be prepared with the specific ask that you want uh, uh, your audience to, um, uh, to consider. Um, part of this appeal is anticipating what is the other side going to be asking them to do, so how do you neutralize that? Um, how do you have effective messengers uh, relative to the action that you're asking people to take, whether, again, it's to vote or to give money or to call their member of Congress or to uh, sign an online petition or to go door knocking on uh, neighbors' doors about an issue. Um, it has to be uh, a very specific kind of appeal because the, I think for me, one of the saddest outcomes of a campaign is a successful campaign that generates a lot of interest and a lot of awareness, but doesn't actually move the dial in terms of making impact because the appeal or the ask hasn't been specific enough. And some of the things we talk about in class are the idea of making individuals feel um, very um, uh, effective and impactful in terms of the efficacy of the actions that they take when many of the public policy goals and uh, objectives that drive a political campaign are often subject to the, this tragedy of the commons that you see here in, in one of the bullets in that uh, people think, well, you know, why me? Uh, wh why should I take steps to improve the environment? My one action isn't going to have much impact. And so how do we, um, in a campaign, kind of balance the idea of making people feel empowered and passionate about being part of something while still understanding that there can be uh, less motivation uh, because of this idea of kind of, of common benefits of in particular political goals and political objectives. And part of this appeal is, as I said, being a member of a group, a, a group that supports something. How do you appeal to your audience's desire to be um, a, part of a, a part of a group, um, to have um, membership or association? And I don't mean formally, often informally, to think of themselves as something, to think of themselves as an environmentalist or to think of themselves as um, uh, an activist. And um, tapping into those kinds of group and social identities is very, very important in making a successful appeal. And then finally, um, and something I'm very insistent on as a trained researcher, is that the measurement of the campaign has to be quantifiable. It's not enough to be able to uh, say that you ran a campaign and raised awareness. I insist on specific evidence of how you raised awareness. Were you able to generate media coverage? Were you able to place um, uh, op-eds in papers around the country? Were you able to generate X number of calls to Congress? Were you able to get 100,000 people to sign an online petition or to show up at a rally? And so when we talk about um, the, both the appeal and the measurement of a political campaign, we don't do it in soft terms. We do it in very quantifiable, specific uh, terms. And part of that ties into, as I said uh, earlier, we spend a, a good part of the class talking about being realistic and having resources. Increasingly in the political world, donors and anyone that's going to fund a political campaign insists on having this kind of metric of measurement. Uh, people don't want to give money to fund a campaign that makes people feel good. They want to, they insist on having real measurements of uh, impact and progress. And so being able to design a campaign with that ultimate measurement 
um, uh, in mind is incredibly important to the success of any larger movement because in order to go back and continue to get funding and to continue to get support, you need to be able to say in very specific terms what you've already accomplished. And um, uh, just kind of getting attention is a not enough of an accomplishment um, because we're in the field of political communication. We want to see real measurements around uh, political impact and political action. So each of these uh, slides, I feel like, is um, in, in many ways kind of its own class that we spend uh, two, two and a half hours talking about doing assignments around, doing additional readings, but it gives you the sense of the the elements that we cover in a campaign, and I hope gives you a better, more tangible sense when I said earlier about how we um, balance the applied practice of political communication with the um, uh, more theoretical kind of learning and um, familiarity and fluency with traditional literature about how political communication happens on an individual level. So I will turn this back over and but look forward to having a discussion and answering questions at the end. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Molly. I, I actually I have a question um, to kind of kick off the, the Q&A session. Um, last year's presidential election was historic for many reasons. Um, you know, the country elected a president who had not had previous um, uh, experience in, in government positions. How do you talk about that phenomenon, the, the, you know, the, the rise of, of President Donald Trump in a classroom um, and so that you can have a productive conversation and that it's not just name calling and, and just saying, well, this is just crazy. Um, how have your, how were your, how did your classes last year react to such a, let's just call it historic election? Right. Well, so it was such an interesting time um, on campus because it was such an unusual election for so many reasons. One of the things that I, um, I, again, I consider it to be a real asset of the program, and I'm very conscious about it, is that I want the program to reflect um, diversity on many levels, including <laughs> because it is a political communication program, I want there to be partisan and ideological diversity. There are not right or wrong answers. We train people to be effective communicators about their political beliefs, about their political values. And so, um, I, I, so I welcome having conversations um, that uh, are kind of diverse and come from multiple perspectives. Um, often at campaign time, we've, you know, have students who are on different sides of different um, of uh, different issues, and I think for, for um, and I'll admit it was a challenging time on campus too because uh, passions ran uh, very high about the candidates and about the outcome, and um, I think one of the things that really helped us in the program come back to, I'm sorry for the sirens in the background. That's um, okay, it happens. I, I must say, I'm uh, uh, downtown uh, DC today, and I think that that might be one of the motorcades. But um, uh, one of the things that I think helped kind of ground us last year during the election is that discussion and commentary was welcome, but it has it has to be not I think it, it, it or I feel those kinds of um, that kind of input and that kind of feedback. Is um, it is appropriate but not helpful for the classroom when we are trying to make evaluations and assessments based on connecting our feelings to things we're learning about. Mm -hmm. So if we, for example, after each one of the debates, spent um, you know a, m half an hour or so in the next class discussing um, the candidates' performance in the debates, and I didn't want to know as much from students who they thought won or lost the debate. I want to know why. So if you were for Hillary Clinton or if you were for Donald Trump, that's fine. But tell me why he, why one of them executed their strat. What was the strategy? How did they execute it? Were they successful in doing so? So it's not about um, just uh, uh, feelings and reactions. It's really about how what we're learning 
about effective political communication applies in the real world. I happen to have a background in democratic politics. I spent um, uh, many years at Heart Research. Um, we do work for democratic candidates um, and progressive organizations, but it's important to be an equal opportunity critic of, um, uh, of all sides in a political debate. So um, you uh, can learn from your opponent. You can also learn from your own mistakes. And that's very much how I want to approach the program is to train people to be objective evaluators of what works and what's effective, and then to go out and take that training and you know use it in a way that uh, incorporates your particular passion or your interest um, to be an effective advocate on a on a particular issue. But our goal for the program is to really provide people with the training and the skills that they uh, need in order to be able to do that effectively. Yeah. So I guess there was a lot of lessons that came out of last year's um, campaign and, and people could say, oh, well, that is a strategy that worked for, for, for President Trump. That's maybe that's a strategy that can work in other means. So there was probably a lot. And I think analyze. what we saw last year is a lot of the, a lot of the rules changed of things that were seen as a strategy that would never work or that's been tried before. You know, it's a, that's a failed strategy. Um, that w was one of the things that made last fall so interesting is that I think a lot of us had uh, incorporate or reevaluate some of the standards that we use because huh. traditional and conventional wisdom about what works and what doesn't and what is or isn't effective was really, you know, challenged in some very important ways. And I think it, they will be lasting ways. And so as a result, the field is, of political communication is very dynamic. Uh, what worked uh, uh, four years ago or eight years ago when an election may not work at, at anymore. And, you know, I think just one quick example of that was Trump's use of social media, which everybody said during the campaign and continues to say during his presidency, you know, you've got to uh, 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 get him away from Twitter and nobody's been able to do it. And yet it continues to be very effective for him. So mm -hmm. a lot of um, in, you know, in many ways, I think a lot of the rules are being rewritten. Wow, it's, a, it's an exciting time to be in the field of political communication. I really wanted to be in your classroom last year, Molly. I really, I wanted to just check in with you every day, um, but I, I just think that's fascinating. Thank you. All right, um, a new student has just uh, joined us. Um, Dashiel, uh, if you have any questions, um, for, for Professor Molly O'Rourke about the program, about classes, about alumni, feel free to type those questions in the chat box. If you have any questions for me about the admissions process, the application, funding opportunities, feel free to type those in the chat box. And Scott has asked Molly, what is the average class size? Right, so that's a great question. The average class size is about, um, uh, 12 to 15 students. We uh, are delighted that our in our first year students, the first year cohort right now, is the largest um, cohort that we've had in the program. So there's 30 first year students in the program, um, which is about double the size that it was when I first came uh, to the program. And so what we've done is create two sections of everything. We did not want to have large classes of 30 students, it's not very conducive to discussion and to exchange and to peer learning, which I think is very important in graduate school. So we've, um, we've now created two sections of uh, each of the required classes in order to keep that small um, uh, program feeling. And just I wanted to add, because I know um, Scott and Dashiel, um, I've traded emails with you uh, separately in terms of um, the consideration about starting in January versus starting in September, that I certainly have students who start in January and successfully complete the program and do very well. I tell students that if they have the luxury of being able to choose or defer, that starting in September, or starting in, I shouldn't say September, it's really August, August. fall semester, mm -hmm. is advantageous for a couple of reasons. The program size is something that makes it very unique. 
Um, students all know each other um, in the class. They all kind of come in new together. They're incredibly supportive of one another, something I take great, uh, I'm very proud of them for. It's not like um, a traditional kind of law school or med medical school class where it's very competitive. Students come in with their own sort of set of interests and goals and therefore they, you know, it's a competitive program in terms of high standards um, and demanding uh, from each other, but it is very, very supportive. And I think um, that, that kind of cohort um, experience, having study groups, being new together, going through the first semester required courses, which I'd say is the most rigorous of the four semesters in the program. Together, I find um, if students can do that and, in, and start in August, that it really provides um, something special uh, about the program. And again, not to say that January start um, is, um, uh, isn't a good option. It is for many students, but I also, I just think kind of being on the more uh, traditional trajectory of taking the first semester, first year requirements starting out in fall semester just makes the program kind of a little bit more coherent um, and I think also just a little bit more intimate and closer in terms of really getting to know your, um, your fellow students. And the other thing is uh, about the size of the program, and this is regardless of whether you start in the fall or in January, is that I don't anticipate the program will get much larger. I don't want it to because I don't want to lose the feeling of having a relationship and knowing each student in the program. So part of that it relates to helping them with their professional goals. I know when we get opportunities for internships and jobs and I really know what each student's passion is and what they're hoping for and so I feel like I can steer things toward them particularly when I, I'm a voracious newsreader consumer and I'm constantly sending um, uh, links or clips of something I read that I know is important to a student because they, you know, have written a paper about it and they're thinking of pursuing that in their capstone. And I, I never want to lose that aspect of the program where each student isn't just a student; they're, you know, really an individual with a, with goals and and a unique um, uh, set of um, uh, priorities for themselves for the program. So that's also something I think is a real advantage of the the size of the program. So Molly, I want to ask about um, the alumni of, of this program. Where, what kinds of fields, what kinds of jobs do students tend to do after this program? Well, so the, um, I'm, I'm so proud. Of, I'm, they're kind of like my, you know, um, uh, surrogate children, I guess. <laughs> I'm so proud of the students who have graduated um, because I really, I mean, they're there. Some finished the program a little earlier um, sometimes a year and a half rather than two years. But regardless, I've had, you know, real relationships and interactions with students. And so I really uh, enjoy following their career trajectory. Uh, I think my students would say, and I, anybody um, who's uh, interested, I'd be happy to put you in touch with current students or alumni students in the program. I think students would say I'm very, very proactive about being um, uh, supportive of their career goals, acting as references, making phone calls, but we, um, right now, uh, for our graduating class that graduated in May, uh, there are two, I had uh, 17 students graduate in May. Um, two are working on the Virginia governor's race right now. One is working at the DGA, the Democratic Governors Association. Three of them are working on Capitol Hill, one for Senator Schumer and two for members of Congress. Um, one is working for a um, healthcare advocacy organization um, that gives you kind of a sense of, uh, and their roles in the, uh, for members of Congress or for advocacy organizations are in press and communication. Wow. So um, uh, the three um, students, alum students who I have who are on Capitol Hill right now are in the members, the senators or members of Congress press office. Um, and um, the, those who are working on campaigns are out doing uh, both events and press strategy. So um, I would say I think the tendency for the students, at least initially after the program, is to stay in the D.C. area because they've usually come to AU and come to the program for the proximity to 
uh, DC to electoral politics, legislative politics, advocacy politics. Students do then make the transition and um, you know, sometimes then move on, go off to Chicago or New York or to, you know, to, to other places, particularly if they're working for a larger communications kind of uh, PR agency. And I, I have students who are uh, doing that as well, and that translates very well outside of DC. One, another thing that I love about um, our alums is that they're very uh, protective and loyal to the program. So they circle back with me whenever their office is hiring, whenever they know of something. So many of my students in the program get internships with alums of the program who uh, let me know about opportunities. I actually have one alum of the program who's been at a uh, lobbying and PR uh, firm here in DC. And uh, every year, she says, instead of sorting through her stacks and stacks of resumes of uh, uh, prospective interns, she just wants me to send her the top three, and then she'll choose from one of those. And so we have relationships wow. with uh, organizations like that that really kind of know our students, know what we teach in the program, know that our students are able to um, contribute right away. And so they, they, they turn to us. And, and that way, I think we have a very nice professional network at the at the program. Wonderful. Thank you, Professor Molly O'Rourke, for joining us today. Thank you, students. Um, if you have any other questions, I know that, you know, Molly wouldn't mind if you reached out to her directly. Um, you are more than welcome to reach out to me directly. My email address is simply my name, Leela at American.edu. And I'm, I'm happy to answer questions, um, especially, you know, if you are new students who are already admitted and they have questions about coming to DC, moving to DC, finding housing in DC, anything like that, uh, don't hesitate to get in touch. And then the last thing I would say is I'm very easy to find on the AU website. If you type in my name, you'll get to my profile, which also has a link to my email. And um, even more importantly than talking to me, I think which I'm happy to set up a, a separate conversation, um, is uh, our ability to connect you with current students or recent alums in the program. Because hearing from us is wonderful and will tell you how great the program is, and I truly believe that it is. But uh, it's very important that you get the student's perspective, too, to uh, understand how their experience in the program has been, and, and uh, our students are very willing to do that. So um, that's also something we can offer. All right. Thank you, Molly, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Bye-bye.